So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Kira Epstein. I'm the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. And today we welcome entrepreneur, activist, and long-term, long-time Zen practitioner to the New School, Rufus Pollock. In conversation with our host and director, Michael Lerner. We will have produced audio and video on our website, and you can also find our recordings on SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Thank you all for being with us again, and we'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Kira. Uh, Rufus, welcome. Uh, Rufus, I'm sure you won't mind if we start with a moment of silence together. Peace, peace. So Rufus, I'm so honored and delighted to uh, be in conversation with you today. We agreed that you would start with uh, a presentation with whatever you'd like to say. You, I think you have some slides to share with us. I have to say, um, I've probably done 200 of these conversations over the last 15 years. And uh, I am completely blown away by uh, who you are, what you have contributed to the world. And I just have a lot of questions I'd like to explore with you. So I'm really looking forward to it. So with that, Rufus, I turn it over to you. Great. Yeah, really. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for inviting me and your colleagues and thank you everyone who's here in attendance today for giving bringing your time and attention to this um yeah it's really a pleasure uh to to be here um um i'm i am gonna i am gonna seek to not, not be given by the slides but to to share a little bit as we go along i'm really looking forward to the conversation dialogue so I will seek to keep the kind of presentation part reasonably uh, brief. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about charting an emerging ecosystem, which is a project that we've been up to at Life Itself Labs. And um, I want to just, uh, I already got mentioned, so I won't say very much. I'm, I've been an activist, an entrepreneur, and a long-term Zen practitioner. And I'm a co-founder and chief idealist of Life Itself. And just a little bit, for those people probably who don't maybe know about life itself, uh, we're a network, a community committed to practical action for a radically wiser and weller world. And we create hubs, we do research, we engage in advocacy to pioneer a wiser, weller culture. Um, and in today, what I want to talk about, first of all, I want to talk a bit about who this work is with and the inspiration. So this ecosystem mapping I'm going to talk about is a collaborative open effort of Life Itself Labs and partners, which have included Anna Schaffner at Emerge, Jamie Bristow at the Mindfulness Initiative, Elka Fine at the IFIS and, the, and uh, colleagues at the Hague Center. And we also welcome, it's kind of an open initiative, people can come and participate. And I also really want to acknowledge that it's obviously part of a wider set of activity, inspiration and collaboration, including uh, with Michael, and uh, other colleagues here at Commonweal who've been, you know, not only direct inspiration, but also we've had a lot of conversations with, and also many, many others. And there's some background uh, reading and references. And I emphasize, I might, I, maybe this can be shared around. I don't know uh, the actual deck when we finished. Um, I also want to say a couple of disclaimers up front uh, in my experience now of uh, sharing a little bit about this topic. So, um, in in the, even the I know the title is kind of mapping uh, that mapping the meta moderns or meet meet the meta moderns, and I think it's good to have a name and I'm going to come to that. But I also know that people have strong feelings and associations for names, particularly about new things. And I just want to say that when we first did this project, we just called it was an exploratory exercise. We called it kind of the ecosystem was X or an emerging ecosystem. And at the moment, we've been using tentatively this label meta modern. Uh, we have no great attachment to it. And I'm actually fascinated by the other names that people would come up with. Uh, I was recently 
quite a long Twitter thread with people where people were suggesting different names and a fair amount of um, uh, strong opinions on various sides. And I remain mindful of there's a whole bunch of names that have been used. And maybe also there might not even be a distinct ecosystem, but rather an ecosystem of ecosystems. So I just want to say that briefly up front. I also want to just say before I begin that it is an alpha and early stage effort. It's being shared with a sense of humility and openness. It's limited by resources and our knowledge. So far, we've done this work without any external funding. Uh, we'd, love, we'd love to collaborate with others with uh, looking at that. And it's partially incomplete, especially in its directory. And I want to emphasize that there are clearly people or organizations that, are, that should be there who aren't. And it's often just a case that either sometimes when people submit things, they haven't been processed yet or uh, just not enough time and energy. And it also reflects straightforward i'd say biases of the different people who've contributed so far so it's biased towards europe or even the united states versus the rest of the world in terms of the themes that are chosen and uh, we really take responsibility for those omissions or, or errors even that might be there just up front in a nutshell what we're suggesting uh is that a, a new kind of social change ecosystem and movement is emerging and it's centered on a radical alternative approach to social change, one that's simultaneously, uh, we call it PI, paradigmatic, integrated, and engaged. What do we mean, and I'll talk a little bit more later, but paradigmatic, it's seeking to shift the entire paradigm. It rather than make incremental change in some area it, uh, of society. Uh, it sees maybe even the, the source of problems at particular areas as relating um, to that uh, in, in that regard. Like if there's something about the climate crisis, it's not just about how we deal with our economy, it's also related to how we see ourselves related to nature in this broad sense. It's integrated and it involves the integration of the inner and the outer, uh, the personal and collective growth as well as systemic transformation. And finally, it's engaged. It's actively engaged with wider society for these purposes uh, versus maybe just meditating you know that might still make a real difference in the world but it's we're out, active out there in the world um i briefly want to touch on the bigger context for this and i think this is something that's i'm going to go through very quickly because i think it resonates i'm trying to hear to resonate with i think the context of these whole series of webinars and the larger kind of poly crisis uh context essentially we're in, we're in, uh, we are experiencing these converging challenges, economic, environmental, cultural, and ontological. We're at a critical point in history, uh, a point of breakdown, but also potential breakthrough. Uh, we risk collapse, but there could also be, you know, a breakthrough to a new, new level. And incremental patching of the old system is insufficient. These issues are foundational, uh, and they go to the root of our existing socio economic and kind of even cultural systems. And we need to go beyond the old paradigm. And in short, I think there are these five key theses uh, that I was kind of written up in a piece I wrote recently with Thomas Bjorkman in collaboration with Thomas Bjorkman, but I think echo many things other people have been saying that we need a transition. The transition needs to be paradigmatic. The transition is of the inner and the outer. The transition would even prioritize being or the inner. Uh, to some extent, and transition requires engagement. And these are kind of five kind of contextual things that I think inform even the work uh, that's going on, but also this effort, why we're doing the mapping effort. And then I want to talk just briefly about why map. Why do a mapping? <laughs> start with the why. First of all, aren't maps problematic? And I think they are to some extent. Whenever we start mapping something, and I think this is particularly true in this space that I've seen, it can be divisive. We could start seeing the map for the territory. We could be like, you know, it's, you know, we all have feelings about like the artificialness of boundaries in the real world that we've created with our maps. At the same time, maps really can be crucial, particularly in, I think, in emerging areas. They help us orientate ourselves. They catalyze coherence. They make things visible, both internally and externally uh, and we should at the same time of all of that remain really mindful so i also want to emphasize two points here about in this particular case of mapping so one is 
in a weird way, this is when we, and I don't even say when we started this project, we didn't really, it was like feeling the elephant in that story. We didn't really know. We could feel like, what is this area that we life itself are operating in? Um, I've been an activist in other areas and, and an advocate and done policy work. What is this space? And it's not very clear. Um, it's actually, even as someone, it's often not only, it doesn't maybe even have a name, but you don't know who are the other actors in it. You don't know who the other, you don't know what other ecosystems it intersects with. And so certainly mapping, I think it's crucial to the, the sort of self-conscious emergence of this group. And it's great being more coherent, more connected, more visible to itself. And that makes it more effective, uh, efficient, just, you know, more productive, more satisfying. Um, there's also this aspect of visibility um, that to people maybe outside or not right in the heart of such a, of what's going on, um, it makes it a lot more visible and easier to engage with it, you know, accessible, it has more credibility, it can have greater impact. And you can maybe think here, I'm, I'm sure Michael Kems, I think you've been a pioneer and maybe other people on this call of other areas. And you'll maybe have had that experience where an area doesn't even maybe have a name to start with, where it's not really recognized as related or, or even both related and distinctive to some other area. Um, but that when that kind of crystallization happens, it can be valuable um so th that brings me to the actual ecosystem uh, map itself uh which you can find online at ecosystem.lifeitself.us at least the output so far i'm going to mention quite briefly what's actually there there's there's a directory um which you can see uh, at the moment there are about 80 i think or 90 maybe 100 or 100. there are more that we have but we do a kind of quality control and try and create Add information about each organization that we add so there's like a profile and so on i want to emphasize one of the things that then came out so we started out with this kind of snowball sampling we just collected organizations and then we started having debates about like which organizations belong in here or don't or you know what which other organizations should be there what are the features that define this ecosystem and i think that's the most valuable thing so far with this kind of analytical effort which Again, I want to say it's a hypothesis, not a truth, but this pie factor. We started to say this kind of, what was it that would make an organization? For example, there are many organizations that are amazing that might work on environmental justice or work on post-capitalism or work on improving the healthcare system or in other areas of social justice. And But why, why would some of them perhaps participate, be kind of on this map, but others might not be in some way? And this was there, these features that I've already mentioned. Um, and I want to emphasize, for example, the paradigmatic uh, point as a particular, um, that, you know, that this deterrent to distinguish is what I would call like valuable but incremental change, improving liberal capitalism, which is maybe a very worthy aim, but it's an sort of incremental, it's not seeking to change the system. Um, and also, I think that another point is, let's say we were Marxists, I, and this is, it could be a debatable point, but one seeking to change maybe the socioeconomic system, but not the kind of ontological worldview and narrative system. And that might be a debatable point, but this point that the paradigmatic is like, is multiple at the kind of worldview and the kind of socioeconomic institutional level. We mentioned about it being integrated, uh, this aspect of inner and outer. And I also mentioned this point of engage and just kind of this example that there are groups that do amazing work uh, on the inner side where it might even, of course, then there is change in the outer world, but it's not explicitly linked to broader social change. Uh, we think of like the psychedelic community. It's not, it's not really clear that people now, you know, there's quite an explosion of interest in psychedelic therapy. It's necessarily linked to profounder or deeper paradigmatic social change. Um, there are other three other characteristics I want to mention. There's more on the website, but three other interesting characteristics that we thought came up quite a bit and might be useful was this aspect of post-individualism. Uh, in we sort of said trans-individualism, that could sound a bit odd. Um, so it seeks to incorporate what's great in individualism, but recognize a real need to kind of to be able to move beyond kind of anatomized individualism. 
um, that we need to work, kind of come together in more effective collectives, uh, and also the ecosystem itself organizing in a network in more communal ways. This whole this aspect of maybe you could call it interbeing in Buddhist terminology, uh, in complex systems, this aspect where all inter there's an interwovenness of an ecosystem, or this concept of a holon or integral from uh, you know to kind of Ken Wilber and integral theory. So this way of seeing the world as a kind of an interconnected whole is quite central. And thirdly, culture making as a desire to go beyond the dominant norms and narratives, even in traditional social justice and progressive areas um, and to make culture to make new norms and values and to end um, one of the things that you can find on the site I think one of the one of the things we sought to do informed by is one of the uh, is how to see this ecosystem is there a way to actually map it so I've, there's a directory but what would an actual map look like unfortunately here because of the overlap this isn't the best uh, uh, version uh, yet of this. I, I don't know if I've, uh, I think I have a different version here. You can kind of see it with, with and without labels. But this was one example of trying to think about this ecosystem in the light of um, almost this quadrant model. There's, there's organizations focused on inner change. There's organizations focused on cultural change. And there's organizations focused on systems change or all three of them. And you can kind of map organizations based on your sense of what are they emphasizing of those different approaches to social change. And that was one way, as well as the topic. So all, some organizations are focused on ecology, some on politics, some on well-being and spirituality. So that's one of the uh, most, uh, I think, you know, early stage, but one of the things we're liking to do. And to finish um, on this front, I'd like to think things we'd just like to explore next. We'd love to extend the directory of organizations we're working on. There's a lot of additional visualization analysis we would like to do. Uh, there's adding people who are really crucial to this ecosystem, not just organizations. A survey, we'd love to do a survey. Who have people been influenced by? What movements, what thinkers, uh, what, what spiritual traditions, uh, what intellectual traditions have people been influenced by or shaped by? Um, and even a map of the ecosystem of ecosystems. What are the different, uh, what are the over, you know, there's, there's, Groups, obviously, there's eco, e e um, you know, environmental and ecological justice or other areas. There's, as I said, post-capitalism, there's um, integral, there's inner work, there's health, areas of health, there's transforming education, there's these different ecosystems going on. How do they fit together? Uh, but I'd like to leave it there in terms of the presentation for now. Rufus, thank you so much. Um, you know, I deliberately... I didn't introduce you myself uh, at the beginning just because I wanted people to hear from you first. And uh, I encourage people to uh, go to one of your websites. I think life itself is one. The, the Wikipedia entry is great. Uh, but just to say briefly, um, uh, you have just done so much across such a range of issues. You're an entrepreneur, activist, author, long-term Zen practitioner, passionate about finding wiser, weller ways to live. Uh, you want your child and all children to li live in a world of love, abundance, and wisdom. You've founded several successful for-profit and non-profit initiatives and some unsuccessful ones, including Life Itself, Open Knowledge Foundation, and Datopian. Your 2018 book, Open Revolution, is about making a radically freer and fairer information age. Your next book, Wiser Societies, is about the cultural dark matter that enables uh, societies to be wiser and weller. Previously, you were a Mead Fellow in Economics at the University of Cambridge, as well as a Shuttleworth and Ashoka Fellow. And you're a recognized global expert on information society. You've worked with G7 governments, uh, international uh, organizations like the UN, Fortune 500 companies, many civil society organizations. You have a PhD in economics and a double first in mathematics from the University of Cambridge. So I didn't want to load all that in at the start. 
I wanted people to hear from you without a whole set of preconceptions that go with uh, with a uh, with a set of uh, experiences like that. But you know, Rufus, the place I want to start right now today, you're in southern France. Uh, you're near Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village. Uh, you are deeply connected to that community. Uh, you have a vision, as I understand it, and I think what you've described to us is of of connecting, not only mapping, but connecting the universe of like-minded communities around the world. Uh, is that correct? Yes, I think, well, I think this, I, I mean, this is, yeah, the simple answer to that is, yes, I think there's two parts of that, um, which is that we, as I, maybe I could put it this, there's kind of two levels. I think there's there's a huge thirst right now in our in our world, uh, and a huge need um, for kind of vision again, for and for kind of I, radical. I mean, in that sense, of positive, like going to the root vision, um, and it maybe doesn't have to be a singular vision, but, you know, for vision, um, because I think more and more people are sensing that there is something really not working um that whether it's we look at the climate crisis uh whether we look uh at inequality whether we look at um simply the functioning of democracy um uh or the not or the absence of democracy whether it's even current events that are right in front of us there's a real sense that something's not working and i think that's distinct from 20 20 years ago, or even a decade ago, actually, but there's, there's a real shift in that feeling. So I think you're absolutely right that one of the things that we want to come around, come together around, and in many areas, is this broader sense of just like, we need transition, uh, we need uh, an alternative, powerful visions um, of, of what could be possible for us. And it's also agreement that something's not working. What I want to distinguish is I think there's a second uh, level of this kind of a broad alliance and then there's like different groups and we doesn't mean we have to all agree they can be very productive kind of but people who are even more like what are their particular things so I, I want to emphasize something in the sense of the charting of this ecosystem I think that I mentioned at the end there's two, two parts of this work is I think how it could evolve in my as we've seen the conversations in this first effort was really to say what is this distinctive area that we felt that life itself was operating more in and which has these features and there are other but there are also many other there's a kind of general i would say kind of sense of groups who are seeking a, a, a wiser well world that may not necessarily be kind of pie they may not subscribe to every aspect of that so i just want to emphasize that i think there are things going on at two levels and there's kind of a bringing together of the ecosystem of ecosystems and there's then the specific one i've you've called meta modern but you could call it meso modern you could give it some other name or just call it the emerging ecosystem um so yeah i just want to emphasize that particularly in the presentation today that i think there's that there can be that alignment on just deeper values than uh, we put of those theses at the beginning maybe a need for transition and then this specific approach to social change which i think is kind of really exciting though when we see that kind of uh recognition uh and interest it certainly wasn't one i think that was so there um and or, or kind of bubbling up as much as it is now. You know, uh, here we are, March 24th, 2022. And um, at least from the point of view of much of the world, uh, we had the climate crisis, then we had COVID on top of that. And now we have the war on the Ukraine, which has become the third poster child for the global poly crisis. I mean, as you and I know, the way we describe it is that you can count them any way you want, but uh, the global poly crisis has perhaps two dozen identifiable major stressors, environmental, social, technological, financial, economic. You could cut it any way you want, define the stressors any way you want. They're interacting with ever increasing speed and force. They're creating future shocks that are ever more powerful. And so these future shocks keep coming at us. And now we have the war in the Ukraine, which at first seemed like 
an immense European tragedy of, you know, unbelievable proportions. But now, you know, uh, President Putin is uh, talking about nuclear war. And so it's not only uh, an immense European uh, crisis, which, of course, like all major poly crisis events, is rippling out through all the other sectors, you know, supply chains, finance, uh, you know, the, the, the wheat in Russia and Ukraine can't reach North Africa where there's famine. So we're just watching it ripple out just the way we watched the climate crisis work ripple out and we watched COVID ripple out. So I think the first thing I'd like to ask you is today, because the, the nuclear saber rattling has just started this past week, not, not only tactical nukes, but global nukes, you know? So is this in any way sharpening or awakening something in you that gives a deeper urgency or a deeper sense of clarity about these conversations we're having? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think if I had to ask in a certain way, it's not, in a weird way, no, uh, I, I, for me personally, I think there's two parts to that that I can speak to. So one is I have been someone in my life uh, too attached sometimes to urgency and to, in, in myself, I'm not saying that was your question, but I, just what it speaks to in me is like a fixing. Sometimes there's an aspect in what's happening where we, you know, I, I have been in my life sometimes as an activist, like a reactivist. I'm, we've got to fix something. And one of the great teachings for me that I got, uh, just both is in Buddhism, but and in many traditions, but also is, is that kind of a aimlessness, -ness, which is one of the kind of major, the kind of the, uh, um, I think it's the measurable minds, whatever it is called, but basically that we don't have to get anywhere. And so one thing I have at the moment is I see a, um, just like there was even weirdly at the beginning of COVID, you know, a lot of suffering, I think it touches something like the Ukraine crisis. So really profound. I mean, not only is there really profound suffering for people uh, in the world that we can be like, wow, you know, that this was unimaginable. This kind of like this, this is, we haven't seen it in Europe for 60, 70 years. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of shocking. Um, and and so one heart just goes out to what is going on. And not only, not only to the Ukrainians, but also I mean, Russian soldiers are dying. Right? You know, there's many, there's, this is soft, war is suffering. Um, but there's also this aspect of like the, the, the kind of, you say in terms of the larger crisis, there's a kind of, in, in myself, there's been like, the, you can have deep compassion, but this kind of desire to fix, or like we've got to resolve something. Um, I think can sometimes be what has got us into this. So there's this kind of aspect of, there's that. I think the other aspect is the lingerie. So uh, the, the question we have to see in crisis like this, we would never let a good crisis go to waste. But we sort of did that to some extent. Um, I, what I'm saying is that, you know, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. We can look into history and be like, okay, how do we know? The thing is, it's uncertain. It's like an avalanche. We don't know what stone will set it off. I think the overall point, though, that is that there are these growing set of stresses. And it's systemically, at some point, something's going to happen. And I think we're so deeply unprepared for that, psychologically unprepared and socially unprepared. So I, I'm personally, in a way, when I look at the Ukraine, it is a moment for exercise, our deep compassion to take action. Um, but also, it, in some sense, I think the good thing that, and I don't mean it, if anything, is that people are present to crisis, which is otherwise, unfortunately, the long, most of the things that get humans in the end aren't like that. Um, you know, I think of uh, the Mayan civilization or, or Easter Island, or I think of the Roman Empire. As, as systems break down, unfortunately, most of the time it isn't at that dramatic moment. It's the long kind of disintegration. And at some moment, then Easter Island, there were no trees. There were no more trees. In, in Roman Empire, just, you know, it kind of got worse and worse at some point, you know, then Rome's overrun. And I think that's much harder for humans. It's like the boiled frog. So I think what's, what is powerful about the Ukraine situation and, and nuclear war is it's visceral, whereas unfortunately climate change isn't. There won't be a nuclear strike with climate with the climate crisis, but it could be actually more, well, maybe it wouldn't be more devastating necessarily than full-on nuclear war, but it could certainly be more devastating than the, the Ukraine conflict right now. 
but it's one that we don't see. So I think that is a really powerful and valuable lesson. Um, but it must also be complimented that we don't fall into fear or kind of, um, I, I guess it's like that, that reaction, but be like, okay, what, how can we bring compassion? How can we even bring love to, to Vladimir Putin? <laughs> how can we bring, see the suffering that someone must be in to act in this way? And can people bring wisdom right now on all sides that we don't have something terrible like nuclear war? How can we bring that wisdom and that energy? Because I think we all can contribute in some way, just in, in our intention in that way. Yeah, it's a, well, first of all, thank you for that. And I hear it deeply. Um, are you familiar with the article uh, that was uh, written years ago, but it's a wonderful phrase, the spiritual bypass article? Do you know about it? Yes. Yeah, because, you know, the question of how we respond, not only to the Ukraine and the threat of nuclear war, uh, but to life and to the poly crisis and everything else. I mean, like you, I have many friends in the Buddhist community and um and some of those friends, um, you know, in the midst of these crises, kind of sit in this space of transcendence, you know, uh, yes. so, you know, you know, sorry about that, as the American soldiers used to say in Vietnam, when they bombed something, sorry about that. But, you know, I'm busy transcending over here, you know, and I, I'm going to I'm going to transcend. And uh, then others, obviously, uh, 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 feel uh, that one has to be careful with spiritual bypass uh, to also experience feelings and life experience at the same time. So I imagine, I'm just imagining that you're familiar with this set of dynamics uh, because on the one hand, you don't want to jump into reactive activism, which both of us have done in our lives, but at the same time, uh, in addition to holding an inner space of um, the contemplative world, we also have our feelings, which are very real. And if we're not going to do spiritual bypass, it's important to, to recognize them. And there's something about action uh, that, that, makes, that makes us different. Uh, that, and so at least for myself, I'll just speak for myself. My wife, who does a lot of work, Cheryl Patton, who does a lot of work with toxic chemicals and firefighters, she's just very passionate about firefighters, having almost burned down her family home when she was a little girl. Um, she set up a new uh, thing with the women firefighters of San Francisco to raise money for the firefighters in the Ukraine, which they need, right? Now, it's just one tiny little thing, but I'm so proud of her that she has acted in some small way to do something about this. And so I think that in addition to the contemplative dimension and in addition to the uh, ex you know, experiencing our feelings, that it does something for us when in some way we act. I mean, I think of Thich Nhat Hanh walking through the battlefields in Vietnam with his monks, right? Uh, you know, taking care of the wounded and so forth. So there's that, uh, uh, one of the most beautiful things about Thich Nhat Hanh is that dimension of active contemplative engagement. So I'm not okay. saying anything new to you, but in this moment, it seems useful to devote at least a few minutes to the reality of how intense the poly crisis continues to become. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, one, one of the projects, uh, one of the things that life itself has been a, a, an initiative called contemplative activism. And exactly, uh, and even in the core of life itself, there's the question of like the alchemy of presence and purpose. How do we, how do we retain the presence and the engagement and the purpose? And how do we meld them into a useful, kind of like a, not a useful, not like a term, but a, into a, a coherent and powerful and whole. Um, because I like to think sometimes also it's that, it's like walking walking along a tightrope where one side is detachment. I think it's what we mean in a way by spiritual, but you know, I think of it in love. Like, I don't, you know, um, 
I don't care if you leave me, I'm fine. You know, like there's a kind of aspect where we shut off our connection to our feelings, to life, to, to in some kind of disappearance into the ultimate dimension in a sense, you know, rather than be here in the red, the present, the relative. And on the other side, it's like, if you leave me, I'll die. You know, there's a kind of this, this, there's this attachment that there's the closed fist. And uh, how do we, uh, I think that's part of wisdom is how do we skillfully walk that line? And so in, I think, I think what I also want to emphasize here, I suppose, in the question is as human beings, and I mentioned, I think the Ukraine example is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good one. Um, we do have a, we have a, we have a bias to that which is urgent and visible. And that's in some ways a good thing because if no one did anything, no one would take the action. But that heart connection, like it's cultivating that heart connection to what's going on with the climate crisis. Or for example, what was going on in Russia before the attack on the Ukraine or, or, you know, what goes on in injustice around the world. You know, there's, there's many, there's, there's, there's many things. So I think the, one of the things that we could also take for this is how do we, what I hear you saying is how do we cultivate our connected heart and compassion to the suffering without us being overwhelmed, but where it engages us to take action, not being like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting in my Lotus position. Absolutely. That, and that's also a travesty. It, in my view, and I'm just going to say, I think of, of, let's say, Buddhist teaching, you know, it's like it, they, you know, they're, they're, to, it's there to alleviate all suffering and to take action now um, in, in, in the present to, to, to inside of that. So I think that's the, the, the interesting question is that part of the source of the poly crisis is that we don't, we see urgent things, but we don't see um, important things. That are that are kind of subtle and and the frog being boiled in the water, which is what's happened to the foundations uh, of of our of our system. One of the areas that I, I feel, you know, Rufus, I just have to say, I feel so connected to you. It's a very interesting experience. As I was preparing for the call and going over your incredible work in the world, and uh, and uh, I feel such a connection because we think about a lot of the same things and respond to many of them. And so one of the areas that we've actually talked about before is how do we do good mapping in the poly crisis that creates a system of both consciousness and engagement and your PI system, for example, PIE. I'm sure you didn't pick that by accident. You didn't pick pi by accident. You know, it's like pi the, you know, the number, but it's not just that. Um, but um, how do we map in ways that encourage both con the consciousness dimension and the engagement dimension by creating flows of information that are not overwhelming but at the same time, create a shared cultural meaning-making map or ecosystem of ecosystems to be more uh, uh, complex uh, in ways that are accessible to people. I know that's a, I didn't say it really well, but the point is you've thought a lot about technology, about economics, about systems, about all kinds of things. You've launched a half dozen major projects about data and how we use it. What is the shared map that people like us who are committed to the poly crisis can find useful? But you know the theory, well-known theory, that if you really want social change, you don't have to convince any everybody. I've, people use different numbers, but you need five or ten percent of the population, right? Yeah. So, how do you how do you create a map that's accessible to the five or ten percent of the human beings who who think about this stuff that creates the coherence that that we both seek? Yeah, great. And I, I even hear, I mean, I'm just I think I might hear try and uh like kind of live, I don't know if I'm gonna succeed in this, but I'm gonna kind of live note 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm just maybe put a note, uh, I, I will put a link here uh, to maybe other people who, if anyone wants to join in. But I think the underlying question was like, how do we build kind of like a critical mass, e.g. five to 10% self, you know, self-consciously, you know, supporting uh, paradigmatic change or something like that. That's, that's kind that's of the overall. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Um, uh, and then, and then like, there's a separate kind of related question is, you know, how, how is, how is mapping related to this? I Beautiful. think is, is like a sub question of that. That's and, um, yeah. And I, 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 and, and like, how should we do mapping? Uh, we do mapping. Um, so I think, I think that, There, I mean, this is the kind of really, this is obviously the really interesting question of how does that come about? And I think there's, uh, there, there could be various theses about that. And I think we've talked before and we love, I mean, I think it's great to look at historical examples, the example of the Quakers and the slave trade as, as one example. And the Quakers have been an incredible force throughout the last several hundred years of kind of at the, at the heart of many progressive social movements um, and have quite a small community. They're not like huge numbers and yet have, have, have helped kind of pioneer uh, many kind of significant reforms or, and, and played also just general kind of positive role, I think, in, in society. Um, and you can think of other, you know, maybe groups a, a bit like that. Um, I, I mean, I can make some comments. How should we do mapping? Just one comment I always have is like, just going to say here, I'm going to come back to the question is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, what's the simplest thing we can do to start with that's that's helpful and that that aspect is like just collect 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 a list and it and i think the other one at the moment is like you know collect a list uh identify common features but i think the other one at the moment is common language i think the other thought that i've had at the moment is what if we were to do this but why bring this up is i'd love to hear from you maybe when we open the session I'd love to understand what ecosystems, like what groups would people say were out there today? Um, you know, if, if we were to kind of like, we might put, I, I don't know what if we were to name one, but it might be, um, what would be, uh, uh, let's say the kind of eco, I mean, it's very large. It has some parts, but there's kind of the eco movement. Uh, there would be subgroups within that. And you might have, um, uh, you know, uh, there's like this psychotherapy, you know, also, you know, psychotherapy. I think one, so why I'm trying to do this is, one of the things you might do also at the beginning is say, okay, can we go and talk or listen? I, I mean, I say talk might be listen to particular communities. I might say, you know, progressive, you know what we call progressive, it's psychotherapy for kind of social change, or for example, Jamie Bristow, one of our partners, you know, in, in the mindfulness community, but he's very interested in kind of mindfulness connected to broad, not just kind of stress reduction, but mindfulness as a kind of not only the movement, but as a kind of something that will wake people up to kind of broader social change. Are there ways to go listen to those communities and understand, A, sometimes the language, but also what their concerns are and then map them to maybe common concerns? Say, oh, okay, um, you know, do you realize, you know, and, and uh, do you realize you've actually got the shared interest? So, for example, I think of engaged spirituality as, a, as, as one example where there's a really kind of like there's a massive existing community of people who are, uh, you know, who are spiritual, religious who are often then socially engaged, but aren't, don't have any, don't have any language. And we just mentioned, I think of like, also of kind of multi like uh, what we might call multidimensional uh, social change, like inner and outer, you know, like they're, they're, they're only engaged with it, but they don't think about complex systems theory. And then normally you wouldn't talk in those terms, but if, if you're example talking to Buddhists, you might say, oh, okay, well, you know, there's this idea of interbeing, of our interwovenness. Do you see how that relates to our economic and social systems? Um, not just your relationship to the natural world and other things. So I think one uh, thing that I think could be really productive would be to go and uh, listen. I'm sure many people are, but not only just listen, but then kind of try and map that. Are there kind of, we put in the center here, or maybe we put it here, like common, 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 uh, co maybe not common principles, but like I may even say a Rosetta Stone, 
I think that might even be a better thing at the moment, that people are often, I feel at the moment, sometimes talking about the same thing um, in different areas. Uh, so you see parts of the climate movement, which now like, okay, we, you know, we need change in many of our systems, but we also need change in ourselves. That connects with, you know, engaged spirituality, engaged with other areas. Are there these places where we can kind of create a, res a mapping between language and terminology so people see, oh, actually we're talking about the same things or at least aspects of the same things. Um, that's, uh, I think, quite, you know, would be quite, quite, quite significant. Um, Wonderful. Quite, I mean, I could talk more, but I want to stop at that. No, no, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, and yes, let's open the questions up. Catherine Fulton has already posed one, one of our uh, colleagues at Commonweal, who has thought a lot about these things with us and has been very helpful. Uh, she writes, it might be good to understand more what was inspiring, but ultimately a failure with Paul Hawkins' attempt to map the emerging immune system of social change actors with his book, Blessed Unrest. They attempted a complete taxonomy and turned it into an organization, Wiser Earth, with the aim to connect people. It was impossible to keep the data fresh and self-organizing did not happen. It ultimately closed. Technology was different, but it wasn't just that. Uh, I, I, I first I should say I'm not fully, I, I don't know much about that. So Kathy, at first it was really valuable you shared. Thank you so much for sharing the question and telling me about that. I think a couple of things. So what I just say, and this is, I said about keep it simple, stupid. The other one was uh, like, have, have, have use cases. <laughs> um, so I think like if you start doing mapping and, and I'm not going to, I've seen some other really great projects, but you kind of get mapping for its own sake. That's that, 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 I mean, I, I know it's kind of obvious, but some projects can kind of you know, I talk about even myself, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a data geek. I love collecting information um, that, but that can become sort of an end in itself. So it's thing it's going to be really specifically, I think it's good to really connect it. So in this case, the question for me almost being was like, who else is out there? I, Cause I want to talk to them. Um, and if you're coming into the space, it can be kind of difficult just to find other people or understand the key ideas. I mean, one of the things uh, talking to some of actually, uh, our colleagues, so people working, let's say, actually talking to Jamie and other people, was like, oh, if I'm coming from mindfulness, I just want an introduction to some of these ideas and this kind of, whether you call it metamodern or this other space. Just there's a kind of that's part of our motivation here is to say, okay, there is a clear juice story for some set of people out there. And I think that's really important. Um, I don't know in the wiser case what the 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 thing is. I'm sure often there's this kind of thing we want to connect people more, but that's hard. People are really busy doing lots of stuff. So in, in our case, we were, we had the addition that doing the ecosystem mapping was, we had a direct need for ourselves at life itself. And we talking to some other people, there was also this kind of, there was a certain need of like just finding other people and, and, and the groups uh, and, and what were the key terms and ideas. So I think that was one example. Um, I, and I, I emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough having clear, you in software terms, they're called user stories or job stories. Like, why are you building X? Why are you using technology X? Why are you doing that? And that's as true of mapping as using a particular software tool. Um, it is a tool to something. In this case, I think part of it um, that you're, that, that, I've also mentioned in the motivations when I gave you the talk is to say that you're trying to, start presenting this if you think of also how things emerge you are going to ultimately want to try and present what's to some degree in ecosystem say okay this is this is distinct you know my experience of let's just talk even about funders or journalists or anyone else at some point they want to be able to look at something and have some kind of understanding of it and a name for it, an identity for it there can be a downside to that because it simplifies it's reductionist it reduces complexity and there's a lot of value to that in that people can more coherently or sorry more easily access this this space this space they can understand it they can talk about it they can connect it with things they already understand 
Yeah, Jerry's written some interesting uh, things in the chat. He says, people like a theory of everything, but it doesn't work in a hurricane. Pachamama Alliance advises start where you are with something you are passionate about. Tell a friend and a family member and do something before you go to City Hall. And he also points out mapping is a good point of entry. Mine is systems thinking for others, permaculture. Absolutely. And a lot of our work in Omega uh, really is based on a systems analysis which goes back to Dano Meadows and uh, limits to growth. Um, uh, speak to that, please, Rufus. Um, to what degree do you find systems thinking in your mapping enterprises uh, to be particularly useful or not particularly useful? I mean, what I think system thinking is one of the key aspects of a more like integrated, I would say, view. So mm -hmm. there's kind of, there's, there's, yeah, it's kind of like, an ecosystem, you know, systems type thinking is absolutely central. Um, when you, as part of the worldview, I think that there are, yeah, is that the question? I think that that's pretty. There's also a question of how does the eco, how do systems that ecosystems actually work? Like a systems understanding of how we're going to affect change. Is that your question more, Michael? There, mm -hmm. of, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there are two parts. So one is, I think that having a theory of change and having a systems theory informed theory of change is valuable. Um, I think that at the same time, much of what we're doing is kind of so kind of you're involved in systems are so complex that you kind of are doing almost you're, good heuristics informed by that larger picture are better than trying to get a really precise picture of like this. I'm just saying sometimes I've seen these kind of diagrams, like, you know, it's like it's bewildering with all of the, the kind of interconnections and, and drivers. And you have to kind of make a kind of simplification of, of, of how we're, of how you're going to do stuff at the beginning. So I think um, that's what I'm saying in terms of um, it actually informing the the approach, but I think the basic point that there are not linear. I mean, it's not linear. It's not simple. It, there's a lot of complexity and feedback loops is absolutely central here. I mean, one of the obvious ones. I think this is sort of systems theory, but we talk about quite a lot here. Is uh, life itself is. Let's say you've got um, you've got tech, uh, you've got structure. Uh, like institutions and you've got be what I would call culture and I'd call it being, but you could call it like culture, culture and psychology um, and how those interplay. Uh, and, and even that's one of the contested points. I think actually to go back to, it's quite a crucial question in, in the debate here that I put here and I kind of ran past a little bit is do people subscribe to this? I think this is one big question at the moment in the space um, and it's not like an it's not an it's not like we don't need change in all of these areas uh, to affect change in society. But let, let's take climate change. I'm just trying to illustrate it. You could say we just need better solar, or you'd say we need a carbon, we need carbon pricing. So so better solar would be here, carbon pricing would be here, and this would be like being would be we need a new attitude to the environment and to our relationship to the planet, and you know, so on. And of course, a change in culture drives. These all drive each other, right? You know, this drives this, this drives this, this drives this, and vice versa, right? It's all interdependent, you know, it, it all flows back and forth. But identifying those key flows is quite important. Uh, and, and what's and, and that's one of the things we're saying here. Transition prioritizes being, whilst inner and outer are both needed, inner development has primacy. That is, it should be prioritized and takes ultimate priority. Um, and that's not that's a that's for example a, a strong thesis. That's not that's not one everyone, you know. There's a bunch of people say we're gonna you know we just need technology. Well, technology is going to drive being. You know, we're gonna we're gonna change technological structure of society. Or the Marxists would say, hey, we just need to change structure. We just need to change the ownership of the means of production, and then we'll live in utopia. Whereas I would say, hey, unless we really deal with being, which is of course produced to some extent by structure and technology, unless we transform ourselves. We're not really going to be able to successfully transform structural technology. Uh, Rufus, you talked about the importance of language, and I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, those who know me know that one of my particular 
whatever you want to call it, biases or perceptions, is that um, at least it, it, that this widening cultural gap around the world uh, between uh, progressive elites, often largely urban, and conservative, more rural populations is happening everywhere. It's not just Donald Trump. Um, and that... Um, yeah. Uh, and that economic interests, uh, in order to uh, continue to profit and pollute, uh, have gotten very good at mobilizing uh, conservative cultural constituencies uh, to oppose progressive elites who are trying to do the kinds of things that in your little structure we see. Um, so my approach is to say that one of uh, the great tragedies is that uh, progressive elites abandoned uh, working class people uh, in the service of, uh, uh, you know, quote, spirituality, uh, uh, quote, you know, identity politics, what all of which are good. Uh, and and so when we look at your map, we see, you know, what do you put up? You put up mindfulness, engaged spirituality, psychotherapy, you know, uh, eco ecological thinking, all climate justice and so on and so forth. These are all progressive means. And so yeah. one approach is to say, well, the five or 10 percent of the population that we want to reach is progressive. And that's why we're picking that language. I prefer personally uh, to find language. Uh, my colleague, Rachel Naomi Remen, who works in psychology and, and, uh, and psycho-spiritual work, is so good at this, but so is Parker Palmer, and so are the Quakers for that matter, that transcends the progressive conservative um, divide because my view is that there are at least as many good people in the conservative end of the spectrum as there are in the progressive end. And that um, if one recognizes that uh, and, uh, and finds language that enable people of goodwill across the spectrum to come together, that the, the potential for getting the right five to 10% is far higher than if we use uh, progressive language. So obviously that's a big debate but I'm curious about how you see it. Yeah, so I think if I'm trying to understand, I think the questions of like why the the kind of the division happened, uh, can, can, can we uh, can we reach across the political? Uh, can we reach across the political divide? Mm -hmm. I think there's a um, can we reach across the political divide? So, um, I mean, I'll talk to the last point first. That one of the, again, the things I think, so I think the point you're making was a really good one that we want to find rather than creating more polarization, uh, we really want to find ways to, to bridge, particularly maybe the progressive conservative side of things, but you know, others. And to give a concrete example, uh, at Life Itself, we've been collaborating with quite a few people around climate work. And one of them was a spokesperson for XR. Uh, extinction rebellion in the uk but really has been talking a lot about a, a moderate flank of the climate movement that should talk to kind of conservatives you know as much as kind of liberals or left-wingers and the point is like everyone cares about their grandchildren right you know you know everyone cares about a future for their grandchildren and i think that's a really good way he puts it and are there ways to speak in a constructive uh you know cross-sectional way um so i think that's first we're just kind of like yes I'll, i think we want to try and find ways to speak in that way and i mean i have a i have a big thing about what really should be progressivism which is that i think um this is a longer discussion but essentially the 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 the, the kind of traditionally, at least what would be called like less in the US, Democrat has often kind of a somewhat abandoned, I would say, economic progressivism for a very lightweight redistributionism. And also, and this is kind of contentious, but it's got a problematic location in the cultural debate, which is if we go deeper, uh, if we go deeper, essentially, what I mean by that is that 
it's sort of gone to this plate of like, we're just mobile global elites. We, it's all multicultural. We don't have any affinity to a particular, uh, you know, thing. We just, you know, that's, I mean, there's a, there's a complexity to that, but one of the challenges is that the way humans have traditionally um, scaled our cooperation over thousands of years has been to build greater and greater senses of us. Now, my dream, I imagine like many people in this call, is that we reach an us that is all of humanity, and or even more than that, that is all, all living beings. At the same time, we should acknowledge that it has taken very long time for human groups to scale that sense of us. And realistically, where we seem to be at this world today is probably the, the few million, the million, the millions level. And when you go, when you go beyond that, you have empires. We've created states non-democratic states for thousands of years that are non-democratic, they're called empires, they've been coherent. But if you're looking for things that are coherent, democratic uh, systems, where people give money, for example, to others who they don't know through their taxes or whatever. And so one of the other things I think that's, that, that really can cross the divide is both a, a wide sense of, 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 of economic inclusion but also some recognition of how do we create the imagined community, which is what binds at least a democratic state together. And that's something to recognize, I think, on the conservative side as, as something, a very valid concern and point. Um, I think it's sometimes dressed up in things that we, we don't like, you know, a you know, it can seem, you know, whether it's religious or it could seem almost nationalistic, but there's something profound that I think the left side of the discussion uh, politically has jettisoned over the last 30, 40 years that's really deep in the human psyche. And, and I think I'm not saying kind of controversial. I mean, Tony Jutt, who is a definite liberal, used to, I mean, he's sadly, very sadly passed away, but would write constantly about this point that the most social democratic, the most progressive economic countries in the world are, you know, Northern European, essentially, like Sweden, you know, these, these ideal social democracies, and they're all culturally and ethnically homogenous, <laughs> frankly, just to be very blunt about it, they're not multicultural. And that's been a real, that's been a real challenge. And I think that that's something that if you're talking to, we need to find language that's inclusive of everyone, but which also recognizes the need to create imagined communities of solidarity and love and inclusion. And I think that's what we can speak to in, 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 on both sides of that. Uh, for example. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. Tony Judd's work is extraordinary. Uh, Teresa Dextres uh, wrote, curious how to decide who the 10% is and is not. I recall in one group of alternative health practitioners, you get people on the fringes together who can't get along with the general society and assume they will have a commonality. But also the, the work of complexity scientist, Thomas Homer Dixon, whose work uh, I think is extraordinary at the Cascades Institute. He's one of the great authors, uh, The Upside of Down and much more. Uh, and uh, so uh, that question, you know, who gets to decide uh, who the 10 percent is? And I do want to come back to this point that um, I'm not talking about the political right and the manipulative and the crazy right. I'm yeah. talking about all the re really good people that I meet when I move uh, not only in rural America, but in suburban America, who happen to be conservative. They happen to be Catholic or, you know, Christian or evangelical. They have found an engaged spiritual or Mormon, you know, or whatever they are, or Quaker. They have found an engaged spirituality. They are good citizens. They you know, care about local causes. Yeah. Um, and, and it just seems to me that the 10 percent that I would look for would not necessarily relate to the language that we've been putting up in your diagram, uh, because just take mindfulness as an example. That's a polarizing word uh, or, you know, eco spirituality or the climate justice movement. So I'm not I'm not at all debating the language you used, which I think for the purposes of our broad progressive community is the right one. I just wonder at what point uh, we begin to look for language 
uh, that Parker Palmer uses, that Rachel Remen uses, that that really does speak to people at a level below their politics. Um, and that reaches them, I would say, at the soul level uh, in ways that people can relate to right across the spectrum. So that truly isn't a critique of what you were putting up. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. I so, see that. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm. I, I grew up on a farm in rural England. So I, I have also quite a strong sense of that. Uh, yeah. And you, you know, even in recent voting patterns, I could say, uh, um, I think, I, I, I do, it's kind of an interesting question, Michael. So I don't know. Um, I, I, let's say I think of the Quakers. Um, the, the, so it's kind of if you're like saying, okay, what who's going to pipe? There's a kind of question of broad acceptance, um, and there's when you're when you are like pioneering a new a, a, like a new direction, how much is it going to be attractive? Like you know, the Quakers didn't really weren't that attractive to the mainstream, and they didn't really like they, they were kind of like a fairly, or you could say like radical kind of Protestantism, which Quakers and the Puritans were kind of part of. Um, they ended up being somewhat degree the future um, in, in some ways. I don't mean, I don't want to make judge any, but I mean, a way of like kind of, they, at least, you know, in the US, they kind of were kind of were key in founding parts of the US and so on. Uh, so I don't know. I, 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 I suspect, honestly, that at this point in the, in the, if I were to kind of go back, where are we in the process of emergence? But when, when new paradigms happen, when you go up here, you have to have some thesis about how do new new paradigms happen, and it's kind of like the old is dying and the new is gonna the new is gonna be born, and you know there's sort of a a new one starting to kind of come. Uh, what where are we in that, and and how and how do you attract new people? So I kind of my sense is that you, you're gonna want to be. In some sense, it's okay to be quite like, um, it, it would be more important to be relatively pure and, and like, then to go, um, then to kind of be broad and then try and like get kind of more, more concentrated. You know, I, I think of this as like almost like a, you know, like juice. I don't know, like you think of something that's concentrated, I dilute. It's really hard to make things concentrated that are dilute, but it's, it's easy to go the other way. And I think we're at a, point where we're quite early in this frankly actually still quite early uh in this uh in the kind of the, the new um so I, I i my inclination is that i wouldn't be worrying too much yet about the broader i'd be like hey if we could even get like a thousand people around the world or like ten thousand who are really I, I don't mean i want to be like you then talk like you engage those people will engage many other groups and like they're all valuable, but I would be like, "Hey, we're pretty early in that phase, and kind of coherence and concentration is probably being highly concentrated in that sense of like, you know, it's ninety-eight percent pure or something. It's probably more valuable at this point than the broader reach, and that that will come. Um, but it that that's that's an opinion. Like, there's many there's many ways of where you are and what both where you are in this transition and what you what you think is valuable at given stages in the transition. You know, this is the, no. this is the old, the old paradigm, you know, and, you know, we're somewhere, somewhere where kind of around here, I would guess that's even a debatable question. Where are you in this process of emergence of the new, of the new? Kristen Schaefer, uh, our colleague, Kristen Schaefer wrote, curious what you think about Robert Reich's The Common Good, a thesis that the right in the U.S., is very intentionally uh, has very intentionally undermined the idea of public common good, uh, which you can argue is a value of the left with the goal of weakening confidence in government institutions, deep, deepening the atomizing mythology of individualism, which benefits corporate interests and the ability to limit regulation. I certainly agree with that. Uh, Rufus, do you agree with that or not? Yes, I, I, I mean, I think that's true. I think that is true to uh, an extent. Um, I th I think um, what, what what I would like to add to it is I feel that there's a lot. 
that I think I'm going to just use the term progressives. I don't actually think they're left or right, but those who seek, because weirdly, in a weird way, the right has, the, weirdly, in the last 40, 50 years, the right has been sort of the most innovative. It's kind of, I mean, like, how radical was the kind of Milton Friedman Hayekian vision of society? Like, it was totally radical. Um, you know, when they had those conferences, I've forgotten their name, but they used to meet up, was it in Austria or whatever? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was totally radical. Like, Keynesian liberal thesis was dominant. I think I, I kind of would invite, um, and let's take Reich. I mean, I think, for example, just take, I'm just going to take two examples where I think the left has really massively missed something or the progressives. So one is, let's say Reich has written also a book on monopoly. They're just co- there's a real lacunae on the left of understanding the role of digital capitalism combined with giving people monopoly rights, like copyright and patents, combined with digital capitalism, is just ma- is the main driver of inequality growth. And, and mainly because large numbers of kind of the progressive elite are in the tech sector. But like, I, I think that, just taking an example, that's not, that, that sort of got missed. I think the other point is this cultural point. I think the, the, the left has had a real, or the progressives have had a real problem of dealing with where are they going on identity politics. And they have a choice in the road on that one. And it goes back to Judd. Judd is not a conservative, but he's writing that piece, Ill Fares the Land, very clearly about this challenge that the left has faced. So yes, the right has him undermined the concept of, uh, to some extent, the common the, the common good and the American, like this, the atomized vision of society and the government as a kind of parasitic. And absolutely that's happened. But the, the progressives have also just been totally asleep at the will. They've had no vision. Other, I mean, once socialism marks and bit the death, there's no powerful vision other than kind of like, we're going to be a bit better than the right wing and we're going to do a bit more redistribution. There's no powerful economic vision, uh, which is what the Open Revolution, the book, I mean, if, just to mention it, the Open Revolution, which is available, I should say, for free, um, you need you need a powerful kind of economic progressive vision for a digital society, for a knowledge society, and you need some kind of social uh, social ontological vision. What is, what is he offering? Um, you know, we had religion, then we had sort of like the religion of the free market or of liberal capitalism. Those have died. We, you need something else. And that's been very deeply missing, I would say, on the progressive side. There's nothing, there's nothing very exciting uh, that, that side. And they also have to bite the bullet of what they're doing about, about multiculturalism and other things. They have to work out what the story that they're, they're telling on that front is. Because it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dilemma the left has not confronted. The right has confronted it up front, maybe not in a good way. Um, but the left hasn't. And it's why, for example, you get working class voters who should be voting for progressive parties in the UK and in and in the US who are voting for Donald Trump or for or for or for Brexit or things like that. Yeah, these are really profound points. And um, we only have nine minutes left. But um, boy, you're just touching on the problem of the left and uh, with uh, multiculturalism, how the right has got a bad answer to that, but it sure has a powerful answer to that. Uh, and the incredibly important point that the right wing uh, economic paradigm was extremely radical, but they had these ideas waiting for a crisis and were able to insert them. Uh, so yes. uh, I know that uh, you are a fan of, um, and by the way, you when you talked about copyright, you wrote a, in 2009, you wrote an incredible uh, uh, piece on, uh, you know, forever minus a day calculating optimal copyright term, uh, which which was deeply influential in thinking about copyright. So uh, you are a, a fan of the Ministry for the Future uh, uh, book. And, uh, and uh, one of the key ideas in the Ministry for the Future is uh, the concept of the carbon coin. And as an economist, sort of a twofold uh, question for you. We did a conversation uh, with Kemp Stanley Robinson on the Ministry for the Future, and it's had an immensely powerful impact on the collective imagination. The Wall Street Journal uh, asked whether the carbon coin could save the world. So my question for you is twofold. One is, in addition to the set of ideas that you're developing about 
uh, you know, interbeing, for want of a better word. Um, have you tried to articulate a set of economic ideas that could counterbalance the current radicalism of the right in a way that would support uh, a, a livable future? And then the second specific question is, uh, in your view, does the carbon coin have a future? Well, so, so to answer the first, the vision, which, as I said, in the open revolution, which people can, can access, is quite, and also extremely short, uh, version intentionally, there, there's sort of a vision there about capitalism and socialism having a baby. So there's something just, there's something just to share, I'm trying to keep it very short here. The most profound change in human kind of economic history happened with, with the invention of, of, or the move to information technology. And I want to prefer to you that di digital is just a means of moving to an information economy. And for almost all of human history, we have lived in a world of atoms. I mean, things are made of atoms. You know, bread is made of atoms, cars are made of atoms, steel is made of atoms, etc. But information is made of bits. And there is this profound and crucial difference between atoms and bits, which is atoms are costly to copy. To make another piece of bread is about the same energy as to make the first piece of bread. Whereas with bits, once you have one copy, you can make millions, almost costlessly. There is this crucial, crucial, crucial difference. We live in a world of costless copying. And basically around 2005, the, between sorry, 2005, 2010, the, the most advanced economies in the world in the sense of technologically advanced or whatever you'd like to say, the US, probably, and it's difficult to do the accounting, but probably moved from a place where they had been uh, over half of kind of value added in the economy was an atoms-based economy to over half the economy was uh, 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 an information economy. And just to illustrate, by the way, how bad our systems are, like how focused our world is on atoms, we don't even have a category for the information economy. It's some part of the service sector, if you do look at normal accounts. It's, you know, that service sector also includes like McDonald's. You know, It, it doesn't make a lot of um, sense. Now, that, that's the biggest shift in the whole of human economic history because it's the shift in the nature of something and to cost us copying. Now, the thing of atoms is because they're, you call them rival in use. When I wear my shoes, you can't wear my shoes. When I drive my car somewhere, you can't drive it somewhere at the same time. But we can all watch the same YouTube video at the same time, pretty much. The bits can be magically reproduced onto my machine and onto your machine. This is a world of abundance. This is a world of almost, it sounds like communism. We can just share information with everyone. Information communism. There's one problem. It costs money or effort or resource, or however you like to put it, to create the first copy of something to write the book, to make the movie, to discover the wonder drug, to design the new aeroplane. So we need some way to pay for that first copy. And the answer uh, to that is we need to find a way to come together collectively. We, put money, we get money together in a group and then we pay for the first copy and then we have unlimited access for everyone to the, to the, cop to the copies that then get made from the first copy from the original. And the funny thing is what... Well, Good capitalist companies are already sort of doing this. So we went for a world where we bought songs one by one. I don't know if people in school can remember, even, even in digital world, we used to buy a track off iTunes for 99 cents. Each track was 99 cents. And we've moved to a world where you pay a fixed fee, you subscribe to Spotify or whatever, and you have unlimited access to their whole catalog, and you can listen as much as you want. So that world is coming. I don't. I would prefer it to not come in a world of Spotify's or Amazon's or monopolists. I would prefer that we had a model of collective collection of the money. That money going out in a capitalist type way, where we pay innovators who've come up with new inventions, that can stay there. But the money is collected as a, us together, and then we all have access to the results. Whether that's pharmaceuticals, whether that's music, whether that's movies, whether that's software, and that's that would be a radical but also plausible economic, uh, like ec economic model. It would, it's one we're already trying out, as I said, for Spotify. It's one that we have tried. Uh, we've already been publicly funding a lot of information production for most of human history. 
most of uh, com- core research and development is funded by our governments already. So this model of funding the rest of the stuff, but doing it in this what I call remuneration rights way, which you can read about in the Open Revolution, combines, I create capitalism and socialism. You have the socialism or communism aspect that unlimited access to information because it's costlessly copyable. And the capitalist part of we need to pay for the first copy. And we do that by collecting money together and then giving it out basically to innovators or other entrepreneurs who've come up with new stuff in a way that's set out in the book uh, in some detail. So that's, that's I think, answer to question one that you, that you asked me. And then the question was about the carbon coin. Um, on the carbon coin, I must say, uh, I, I actually have read the Ministry for the Future. Um, I, I am, uh, I'm skeptical of these kind of like, sort of like, first of all, I'm not a big fan of blockchain and token stuff. And I think it's kind of a bit over, a little bit overrated. I have to, more than a little bit, but you can, if you're interested, you can read more. There's a whole research project we're doing trying to see what are the good things behind that. On the common coin, if you look at it in that thing, I, what I worry about, and I'm not saying I think it's a lovely, I think Kim Lester, I think he's a brilliant, it's like a wonderful science fiction writer. The whole idea is to come up with ideas that make us intrigued. It, obviously, the sort of the sort of this idea that people have because of what's been going on recently, that you can kind of just print money out of thin air. I think we're starting to see the impact of when you print lots of money um, going on, particularly when you miss align it with the level of demand and other stuff. And the kind of book has this idea that the central banks is going to issue all these carbon coins. And the fact it's on the blockchain is kind of irrelevant, but they're kind of sort of going to issue all this money and buy up all the car- all the carbon assets in the ground, all the oil, not going to get burned. Um, and I think that, that that's lovely, but kind of it assumes that what happened under like COVID or quantitative easing can sort of just go on at that level without like there being really significant inflation. And I think the other part of the ministry for the future, I guess, is that it's sort of, it's one of those nice stories where it's kind of more, it's more realistic if bad things happen. But I think that it, it, it doesn't really deal with being, I mean, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. I think one of the great traps of science fiction is it's science. Science fiction, which is our utopian visioning or our envisioning of the future, got totally dominated by technology. I mean, in a way it relates to this point, I was just trying to uh, make before, which was uh, this, which is in in this world, we've got totally dominated in the world we live in right now by tech. Our visions of the future are all about technology. I don't know if people know this. The, the I think it's almost one of the number one bestsellers of uh, the, the 19th century was a book by a guy called Bellamy. I don't know if people know this. Uh, How We May Live, I think it's called. Uh, have I got the right name? No, I've got the wrong name. I have to look it up. But this was this was a journalist who wrote a socialist utopian vision as a novel about how we'd live in the year, I think, 2000 or 1980. There was pure straight up socialism. And it was the bestseller almost of the 19th century in America. That was over here. And it shows you how our society, is, we live in a world obsessed with Elon Musk rather than Marx, which may be a progress. But the thing is, it ignores this. And I think that's one of the, if I'm if I'm honest about Kim Jong-un and stuff, compared to, for example, Ursula Le Guin, it doesn't, it doesn't deal with the transformation of our culture and being that I think we ultimately need to address the crisis. It kind of imagines we'll invent some kind of clever carbon coin and, and that will fix its kind of combination of technology and some structure. And boy, that will solve it for us. Whereas I I really think that if you if you look at what's allowed us to deal with wicked problems, that's allowed us to scale our cooperation as a human species, it's almost always been in our culture and psychology. Um, you know, if I put out one great kind of pitch at the end, there's an incredible book by this guy Joseph Henrich, uh, who's writing books about kind of he's an anthropologist, economist type guy. He's now at Harvard called The Secret of Our Success, and then The Weirdest People in the World. And we see The Weirdest People in the World just points out that I, people may not know this, but the most cooperative, impersonally cooperative people in the world are basically in Western countries, are weird. They're Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, they're the most impersonally cooperative. They'll cooperate with strangers the most and so on. And this largely comes from the Christian church and what the Christian church did about and how it interacted with kin-based institutions, various other stuff. And the fact that in Puritans, God is watching you, right? God is watching you all the time. <laughs> so you better be honest. You better be decent, et cetera. And we've, most of our abilities to scale human cooperation in history 
are coming from religious or cultural institutions, ways of being and seeing the world, um, rather than from technology or kind of kind of structures that we've legally created. And he's also got another great story about a group. If you love it, I, I'm going to run out of time in this call, but there's a great story, group about a group called the Ilahita, like this tribe in Papua New Guinea who went the normal size of tribes, they kind of run out at about 300 people. And this one got to about three or 4,000. And how did they do that? How did they manage to get, stay together as a group? And a lot of it's to do with the kind of religious and other rituals they created that bound them together. And I think that's, I love the carbon coin, but like what you don't get in science fiction is the Ursh Le Guin. Like what is, what would be the sociological innovations? How would we think about consumption? I don't know if everyone's read The Dispossessed by her, but you know, waste is excrement, Odo writes. Like on this kind of kibbutzian planet they're all living on, that's sort of semi-utopia, and she's always realistic, it's never perfect utopia. They have this really different relation to, to what, you know, to consumption. That's what you'd see in a future is some radically different understanding of what growth is. Like the growth would have gone to being external growth to inner growth or something like that. And that's what I would love to see in a science fiction vision of the future around the climate crisis. From the carbon coin to the meme of interbeing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Rufus Pollock, it's been astonishingly wonderful to spend this time with you. Uh, I love it. I look forward to many future interactions and engagement. Um, any last word you'd like to say? Um, I, I think, I, uh, I think, sorry, just, I want to say, um, first of all, I'm just noticing the point in the chat, which I can't emphasize enough to, yeah, donate, uh, please. But I just want to say, first of all, a huge thank you to all the listeners and participants and for people for their comments. A thank you to you, to you, Michael, to you, Stanley, uh, to uh, the, uh, like, I, yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, for putting this on and for the work that Commonweal does. I have to say, uh, it's a good example. I talked about this mapping the ecosystem. When I found Commonweal, it must have been a year and a half, a couple of years ago. I was kind of, I was just so astonished by uh, the integrity of the work and over the time. It's like a real inspiration of the the continued journey and what you're up to. So I just really want to say that in exchange. And um, you know, I love um, my life is given to this. My love is given to an awakening society in a multidimensional sense, the waking up, growing up, cleaning up, showing up, and to finding fellowship with others who are on that journey. And I'm just really grateful to have got to be on this call with people who are also fascinated by that and given to that. Uh, we are, we're honored to be here together. Uh, and we look forward to many more ways of um, communing together. So Kira Epstein, I'll turn it back over to you for the close. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Just one re more reminder that if you want to listen again, we will have the recordings ready in about a week. And if you're on our mailing list or if you follow us, you'll be notified when the recordings are posted. And another reminder to make a donation um, it, to help support us if, if you want to keep programs like this coming to you. And I did put the link into the chat. So Rufus Pollock and Michael Lerner, thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. We'll see you all next time. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 Don't take it, don't, don't, don't.